You voted for it here on your tubes and over on Patreon. Subscribe to me, also give me Patreon money, there's your mandated begging done. And here it is, a video on the Mega Drive. But what specifically am I talking about today? Well, if you've read the title, you already know. If you haven't, or you have but you want more info, here we go. Everybody knows the best of lists for the Mega Drive, or Genesis if you want to be awkward, and there are some true classics there. But what about the overlooked games? I don't mean the underrated, mainly because that's a different word that means something else. No, I mean the games that were and are great, but find themselves pretty much ignored by the wider gaming public. It's not every game. In fact, this list was whittled down from 30 plus to these few. Maybe there'll be another video in the future. There's definitely plenty available on the Mega Drive, and now that cheap plug, I have everything running on OG hardware, using an expensive plug, I'm more likely to push out better videos on Sega's machine. What I'm saying is there will be titles you expect missing in this list, but the magical thing with this being my channel is I can make up the rules as I go. Ah, unlimited power. With the higher ground firmly established, let us do a list. A shmup platformer where you use dragons and some other things as your secondary attack thingy, technical term, Alicia Dragoon has all the ingredients of one of those niche Japanese games that some twit with a haircut you've only ever seen in a cartoon recommends while he, it's always a he, is disparaging your taste in, well, anything else. What makes this different though is that it's actually great and capable of being enjoyed. I don't think it's too difficult to see just why Alicia Dragoon never made much of a splash. It doesn't look modern and cool. It has a name most people would be embarrassed to say out loud. It has dragons in it, the least easy to enjoy of all non-fictional animals. Sega absolutely didn't bother telling anyone the game existed when it did come out. There's been a lot working against it over the years. But none of that factors into the fact, uh, that Alicia Dragoon is really good. It's genuinely a great game, admittedly a smidge off the wall, confusing at times, and very 90s difficult, but superb fun and something you should definitely try out, especially if you use some cheats. Wait, who said that? You have to point out it's starring Poltergeist, even if the game is just called Haunting. One, because his name is so effortlessly lazy, and two, because he's the most 90s creation anyone has ever seen. Regardless, Haunting is a definite hidden gem on the Mega Drive and a strong inclusion on this here list. It's a unique little game, and I use that word correctly because there are no other games where you play as a dead greaser speaking in edgy 90s bodacious speak and trying to totally spook some bogus suit jockeys in a series of increasingly gnarly levels. I may have grown up in the 90s, but really that lingo doesn't come naturally. Anyway, it helps that Haunting is fun to play too. Limited, I will say, and not something that particularly develops beyond following people around harassing them for the lols. Oh good god, this game is the internet. That explains everything. Except Haunting is good and the internet is objectively bad. EA obviously felt Haunting was overlooked too, with it included as part of the frankly excellent EA replay on PSP. The problem there is nobody cared about the PSP, so nobody bought it, so nobody was officially introduced to Poltergeist, the coolest of dead dudes, so Haunting remains overlooked. Spooky. In 1997, nobody cared about the Mega Drive. The PlayStation and Sega's own Saturn had seen to that. As such, a movie tie-in wouldn't have been under as much scrutiny from the license holder as it would be on the main consoles. Say hello to the Lost World, an inventive, ironically ahead of its time romp, through some open-ish world progression, vehicle sections, non-linear progression, lovely for the Mega Drive graphics, and a general sense of, huh, about the whole thing. By no means is The Lost World a great game, but it bags a place on this list owing to the lower bar to entry for licensed games. Plus, it's alright, you know? It's not the kind of game you think of when picturing Mega Drive games, and considering The Lost World on PlayStation and Saturn was a big skip fire, it's genuinely impressive this version managed to be half decent. The Lost World isn't exactly a classic in its own right, but it's unique, it's interesting, and it massively flew under the radar back in the day. If it was riddled with Goldblum, we all know it'd have been an all-timer. As it stands, it's just a pleasant surprise. There are some names on this list, but I have to say Twinkle Tail is my absolute favourite because I have the mind of a six-year-old. Handily, I get to say the name a lot in my life because from now on I'm going to go around recommending it to any and all as it's really rather very definitely good. Twinkle Tail is a shmup, except instead of a spaceship, you're a witch, and instead of inevitable forward motion, you control the motor functions of this magi hag. 
That's about it on the surface. It's got some extra gumph on top though that makes it a little bit better than you'd expect from the definitely underdeveloped genre of witch mups. I wish I hadn't written that, it's so hard to say. Different magical attacks, each able to be powered up, the need to move and position yourself to not constantly get hit in the head with rocks, and more comes together to make something surprisingly strategic and much more enjoyable than you might expect on first glance, or on hearing its name. Twinkle Tail is challenging, fun, arcade-style action and has the kind of name I want to say just one more time, so I will. Twinkle Tail. Note, not Mega Man. Yes, this little robotic dweeb looks like the character everyone pretends they love, but Pulse Man is in fact an entirely different little robotic dweeb who nobody pretends to love because nobody seems to know he exists. And what a shame that is, for Pulse Man is a superbly tidy little package, mixing your good golly gosh this is definitely a 16-bit platformer action with some enjoyable timing-based puzzles and a genuinely gorgeous look to the whole thing throughout. Probably the most striking, or should I say shocking, <laughs> thing about Pulse Man is this method of navigating some levels and tackling light puzzles. Now, I'm not one to say Nintendo has stolen all of its ideas over the years and is a disgrace that should be shut down and all its employees launched on a one-way rocket trip directly into the sun. I... I think I went too far there. All I meant to say was Mario's electric travel wasn't as unique as I first thought. And there's nothing wrong with that. Just got away from me a bit. Pulseman's great. By the way, Pulseman is from the same game freak that released Pokemon a year or two later, showing the studio is, well, was, capable of making something other than your favourite illegal Monster Fight Club simulator. Physics! Aren't physics great? If we didn't have them, we'd all just be gases or something. I don't know, I didn't do physics beyond my GCSE, stop judging me. One thing I'm more certain of is that without physics we wouldn't have Subterranea, a great little physics-based game of exploration, shooting and rescuing idiots in caves. There are plenty of enemies and puzzles to tackle in Subterranea, but just like me after a couple of baby shams, your biggest foe is gravity. You're always working with and against its force, trying to balance your ship while shooting enemies, paying attention to your fuel, carefully landing to plan your next move, and picking up big things to drop in other big things. And with every thrust there's gravity, always remaining a factor in this fiendish, smart and genuinely impressive little number. Oh, and it has a Jasper Kid soundtrack, which is always a bonus. This one had absolutely passed me by to the point that I didn't even know one of my favourite PSN games, Pixel Junk Shooter, it takes plenty of its cues from this overlooked Mega Drive would-be classic. Physics! Physics! Your regular run and gunner starring a giant stompy robot this is not. Ranger X instead does things like, um, different stuff. Let me know if that was too complex. Step 1. Your gun. You shoot things with it. Step 2. A jetpack. It lets you scoot around the skies like a metal butterfly of death, while throwing in plenty of tactical opportunities. Step 3. Your little friend who also scoots around while you're scooting with your jetpack and allows extra scooting as you join with it and ride it like a motor scooter. Basically, it's got layers. More layers than a particularly excellent sandwich, and it's difficult to see why this one has largely flown under the radar through the years. Maybe it's just because people despise joy and go out of their way to destroy the hopes we have here in the future of ever seeing the game re-released. Actually, Ranger X is the kind of thing that needs a remake. Admittedly, with its developer Nex Entertainment going under a couple of years ago, that's probably quite unlikely, but maybe I can buy the license. All I need is thousands of you to support me on Patreon, and then we'll be able to... Honestly, this is probably the best known of the Overlook games on Mega Drive. I legit remember eyeing it up in Blockbuster back in the day before ignoring it and renting Kevin Keegan's Player Manager on SNES. True story. I still maintain it wasn't the worst decision I've ever made. Okay, so Story of Thor annoys me because it doesn't believe in diagonals. There, I said it. But it's just so lovely and pretty. It's good fun, often compared to Zelda, but I think more a uh, Secret of Mana alike. The music is beautiful, considering this is the Mega Drive, the console with a music chip designed by someone with a genuine love for the sound of nails on chalkboards. It's a big, smart lark, easily up there with the best of all time on the console, probably in the... 25, I'd say. It's also, in a large part, ignored by the general populace, because instead they want to harp on about... Eh, but that would be telling, I'll get to the harping on factor towards the end of the video. As for the name, you may have heard of this one under its stateside moniker, Beyond Oasis. 
I'm willing to bet it was changed in Europe thanks to the threat of legal action from those famously litigious and assiduous Gallagher brothers. That, or because its actual name was the story of Thor, could be either. Nobody knows what El Viento means. It's from a long lost language, once thought to be spoken by a few select Freemasons who all happily died in a helicopter crash. Scratch that, I've just been informed it's Spanish and it means the wind for f El Viento brings to mind all manner of 90s flavoured arcadey, shooty, platformery things. That's the specific genre, by the way, but manages to be completely its own thing at the same time. Traversing the increasingly off-kilter locales, yes, this level has you riding a dolphin, you make your way through maze-ish levels, whip your boomerang at Dick Tracy lookalikes, and use magic in a fairly strategic manner. It's a game designed with confidence, even if its levels seem to be set in locales randomly pulled from a hat. And while it's undoubtedly difficult, El Viento does feel like the kind of game that you could learn and actually improve at. Imagine that, unlike so very many 16-bit games that just existed to make your life hell, because you had the temerity to try and play them. It's also the third game on this list with a female lead character, which isn't exactly standard for any games, never mind ones of this era. And oh no, some of you are going to make salty comments, Why do you have to bring gender into this? If you're after a game that looks like it was made in 1991, you're out of luck with Wardner. No, this one looks like it was drawn in proto-MS paint circa 1963 by what science refers to as an incompetent buffoon. It has its charm in an I look like a Master System game way, but generally speaking, you'd be forgiven for glancing at Wardner, scoffing haughtily, then walking away and never thinking about it again. Those who play it, on the other hand, are left thinking about Wardner forever. I want to say because it's a good game, it is. And I want to say because it's a woefully overlooked platformer that deserves a place not in the top 10, but in the also-rans of the best of lists. It does, but that's not what I'm getting at. No, Wardner is a game that lives with you forever after playing it because it looks all cutesy and decidedly 80s, it is, until you get to this fake kidnapped princess and this happens. <laughs> no, don't don't worry about it. I didn't want to ever sleep again anyway. I'm, I'm cool with never having dreams again, just furious nightmares. I'm glad Wardner has broken my brain out of nowhere like a cerebral RKO. That's ten overlooked goodens, but it's not everything. No, I want to slaughter some sacred cows with Bransfield's pointed spear of truth by tackling three of the Mega Drive's most overhyped titles. You know, the ones that people automatically hail as great, but are not great. Even though it's just three of many, many more, I still feel like we're back to that unlimited power again. It warms my innards. Wise well, for me, oh do shut up man, seriously, the amount of people I've heard in my life saying Altered Beast is great makes me genuinely sad. It is, was, and always has been terrible. You just remember it as good because you were a child and therefore stupid when you played it. A solid mid-90s example of the graphics not making the game, Vector Man looked impressive and showed us things we never imagined the Mega Drive could do. It was also the epitome of banality in 100% mid-90s style over mid-90s substance. Look, I bought into the hype too. I thought I loved Earthworm Jim back in the day. We were all duped. It was a stylish, personality-heavy title lacking in that all-important good game factor. Playing it today is an exercise in irritation, boredom, and actual sadness. And there's your list. Please do leave comments with your favourite overlooked greats, it'll keep me warm at night. And don't forget to subscribe and check out my Patreon. All the dollars I get on there help me do things like buy a Mega Drive and refurbish it, thus leading to, well, this video. Magic! These folks helped me to do that thanks to their amazing Patreon contributions. And these higher tier supporters help me afford expensive things like the Crix wireless Mega Drive pad that I am now in love with. Video Brains or Jake Tucker, Takara Hoshi, Lola Osman. I think even if this channel made millions instead of nothing, I'd still have no money because I'd be spending it all on OG hardware. Ah well, here's to bleaching my snares in the garden. Bye!